God exists for the glory of God. God does everything he does for his glory. And when that began to come home to me, and I had to wrestle with whether I liked a God like that, my life shifted. We, I was newly married. We were just in seminary. And I remember saying, Noel, you know, one of the, one of the biggest evidences that your world is being turned upside down by the centrality of God in the mind of God is your prayers. I mean, why is the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name? Like, take yourself seriously. That's not for him. That's for us. We got to get in sync with that because Jesus said that's one, that's number one, kingdom next, will next. Or do I get backwards? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. First three petitions, God, 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 do it for yourself. I said, your your prayers are changing. You you sound different when you pray as a 23-year-old who's being blown apart by the the centrality of God in the life of God. So let me show you what, just, just six quick glimpses of what did that. I mean, there are dozens, dozens in the Bible. So I'm asking this question, and you, you need to come to terms with it. From, from predestination to consummation, why does God do what he does? Ultimately, there are a lot of subordinate reasons. I wrote a book called 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. So I'm not, I'm not a reductionist. But I know number one, and I want you to see number one. Predestination. I've got one verse for each six stages of redemptive history. Predestination. Ephesians 1.5. He predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's why you were predestined. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Number two, creation. Why did he create the world after that? Bring my sons from a, this is Isaiah 43, 6. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. You wonder why you exist? Oh, it is so thrilling at 23 years old to discover, I know why I'm here. Ultimately, I know why I am here. I know why I'm in Belfast. I know why I'm standing here. I'm not at a loss. That verse is clear. I was created for his glory. Number three, incarnation. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts saying, Glory to God. You say glory to Mary, glory to mangers, glory to Jesus even. What, what, what should you shepherds be seeing when you come away from seeing this baby? God is glorious. God is glorious. That's what you should be saying. Number four, substitution, Christ's work. On the cross, this is in Romans 3.25, God put Christ forward as a propitiation. That means uh, one who satisfies the wrath of God. Puts Christ forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Here, Here comes. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Christ died for God so that he could die for you. He vindicated God so that he could justify you. Number five, sanctification. Is anybody making any baby steps in sanctification? Yes, you are. You are. 
If you're a Christian, you are. Why? <laughs> Why is the Holy Spirit doing this for you? 2 Thessalonians 1.9. These, oops, I skipped it. Philippians 1.9. Almost got to consummation first. Sanctification. Philippians 1.9. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Are you becoming a more loving person? Are you becoming a more patient, kind, meek, gentle person? Are the fruits of the Spirit being worked out in your life? If so, I'll tell you why. To the glory and praise of God. Number six, last one. Second coming. Why is he coming back? Consummation. Why is Jesus coming back? Oh, hasten the day, right? Second Thessalonians 1 9. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes on that day. Here it is. To be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. I love clear sentences. He's coming to be marveled at. Like, you're marvelous. That's why I just came. It's that simple? Utterly life-changing. Utterly life-changing. If you believe everything from predestination to consummation is for that. That God does everything he does for the glory of God. So you exist, your family exists, your churches exist, Northern Ireland exists, the world exists, the universe exists for the glory of God. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, we use words like glorify, glorify, or magnify. What does it mean? What, what's happening if you do that? I mean, my dad said, my mom said, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Glorify God. What, what, what does that mean? To glorify God does not mean make him glorious. We're all agreed there, right? He's glorious whether you exist or not. So you can't make him glorious. So glorify is not like beautify a room. Like this room is boring. We're going to make this room beautiful. So beautify this room. You never do that. It's heresy if you try to beautify God. Or glorify God like that. It's helpful to take the word magnify and, and distinguish between magnifying with a telescope and magnifying with a microscope. We all know that you can do both, right? To magnify, you can magnify with a microscope. So you can take a human cell, which is invisible to the human eye, very, very tiny thing, and you can make a tiny thing bigger than it is. So trying to magnify God like that is blasphemy, right? He's so tiny, he needs all of our help to look bigger than he is. That's blasphemy. So you don't magnify God like a microscope. What does a telescope do? A telescope also has lenses that magnify, and telescopes magnify stars. Why, why do we need to magnify stars? Because you look up, up at night, they look like pinpricks. Are they pinpricks? They're bigger than the solar system, which is the way God looks to this world. Pinpricks, little teeny erasers in the night sky. He's absolutely pointless, beautiful, not. And your job is to put a telescope to their eye. That's what it means. Make God look like he is, right? Make God look like he is, namely Bigger than anyone can imagine. More glorious than anyone can imagine. So, how do we do that? To magnify God like that is to, I'm going to argue, experience Him and show Him 
to be what he really is. Those two words. Experience him and then show him to be what he really is. Here's another name for that. Worship. And yes, the implication is all of life is worship. Which is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Right? All of life is the experiencing of God as supreme and the showing of God as supreme. You can do it in church with songs. You can do it on the street with love. And you can do it with a roommate in words of witness. There's lots of ways to show and deep ways to experience. Now, why do I use those two expressions, experience and show? Because a lot of a lot of reform types get nervous with the word experience, which I think is demonic, not to overstate things. We must experience him for who he is, and we must show him for who he is. Because experiencing God is an invisible act of the mind knowing, and the heart feeling. And God doesn't intend to be glorified invisibly. He wouldn't have created the universe. And showing God is a visible act of the body doing. And both both parts of experiencing invisibly and showing visibly are necessary without either they're incomplete. If we try to show God when there's no experience of God, there's a name for that. Hypocrisy. Woe to you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup. Make God look really, really nice in worship. Nice music. Nice preaching, nice everything. And inside you're full of greed. We've seen that over and over again in the States as pastors go crashing to the ground in greed. If if we think we are experiencing God where there's no impulse to show God, we've got another name for that. Dead. Faith, if it does not have works, is dead dead. A good tree bears good fruit. So the inward experience that glorifies God is knowing God truly and feeling God duly. Knowledge that is true to God, feelings that are due to God. We cannot glorify God as we ought without knowledge that accords with God's truth and feelings, yes, feelings, that accord with God's value, greatness, beauty. If you think you can glorify God by feeling nothing as you look at his beauty, look at his value, look at his greatness, you just don't get the meaning of creation. The heart was not created to be blank as it stares at infinitely satisfying beauty. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, Paul said in Romans 10:2. So without a mind that's in tune with true views of God from the book, Worship is empty. And we have a description of experience or knowing that has no experience. Even the demons, even the demons believe and tremble. Knowledge minus feeling about God is demonic. It's what the devil has. 
The devil can't love him, but he can know him. In fact, the devil, I would argue, is probably more orthodox than anybody in this room. Meaning, he knows more about God, and he trembles. But he hates it all. And we have the enormous privilege, by the Holy Spirit, to have been awakened to the beauty and the value and the greatness that the devil hates and is therefore blind to and blinds others to. Let's bring all this to bear now as we move to the end on corporate worship. I've seen in the Getty website and materials these verses, and I feel really, really happy to read them to you. Just two verses on corporate worship in the New Testament. The first is Ephesians 5.18. What do we do when we come together? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing. (laughs) Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. That is a rich sentence. Or here's Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's really clear. That's glorious. That's full. It's not truncated. I'll sum it up in six sentences, six statements, six observations. Number one starts with the word, right? Starts with the word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Any worship that's not starting here is going to go haywire. Not going to work. Number two. Fullness of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He illumines this so that these brains can see what's really here. So seeing Christ for who he is in the word. That's number two. Number three. I should have said just number two. Illumination by the Spirit. Number three. See because of the illumination. So I broke them out. So the word comes. The Spirit illumines. We see. Number four. We're moved by what we see with affections, like thankfulness, making melody with your heart, giving thanks. The mind is alive to truth, and the heart is alive with affections for God. Number five, this focus of our mind on God, these affections of our hearts for God, overflow with singing. So singing is number five, and number six is simply you do it to people and you do it to God. Singing to one another, singing to God. Both of them are explicitly in these two verses. Let's make sure we get this. It's not as though when you sing, some of your singing is to God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. It's not as if some of your songs are to Christians. Come, Christians, join to sing. No. All of your singing is to God, and all of your singing is to others. The fact that there are others listening is why we call it corporate, and the fact that you're singing to God is why we call it worship. Corporate worship. I mean, nobody puts on noise-canceling headphones while singing, great is thy faithfulness, because we're singing to God. And nobody in their right mind says that when we sing, come, Christians, join to sing, that we don't want, long for, and believe, God Almighty is stooping low to listen and enjoying our heart's song. All singing is Godward. All singing is manward in corporate worship. So I come to an end by asking the question that I 
piqued you with at the beginning, what shall we say to those folks, and I could tell you where most of them live, who say, you got it all wrong, Getty Piper. You, you just, you should not be telling people that we gather for worship. We gather for edification. We gather to teach. We don't gather for worship. It's not a New Testament concept. You cannot find services called worship anywhere in the New Testament. That's true. <laughs> like, whoa. Is that a problem? Here's what I would say to any of you who may be here who think that way. To say that we should gather as Christians to teach and edify on the Lord's day and not to awaken and express Godward affections is like calling for marriage without sex. Eating without taste. Discovery without delight. Miracles without wonder. Gifts without gratefulness. Warnings without fear. Repentance without regret. Resolves without zeal. Seeing without savoring. And my answer to that is, no! <laughs> Absolutely no! When your church gathers, of course you're gathering for edification. <laughs> the Bible says so. Let all things be done for building up. To which I ask, up to what? Building up to what? Edifying to what? I'll read you Peter's answer. Here's Peter's answer from 1 Peter 2.4. You are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And one of those beautiful sacrifices of praise to God is the fruit of lips, Hebrews 13, 15. And one of the sweetest, most precious gifts of God, fruit of lips, is singing. Why is that? This is my last question. Why is that? I mean, why didn't God create a world without singing? Why didn't he just shut down 10,000 radio stations and all they do is play singing? What's with that? Just shut them down. Why, why doesn't he just silence every concert hall? Why doesn't he silence the song that rises up in every culture on the planet? Why? Partly, I think, because when people sing, a new God-designed, God-reflecting beauty comes into being. But mainly, I think, it's because singing, music with words, singing has a peculiar power to awaken and carry, awaken and express strong affections which God made for himself. Singing is my definition. Christian singing, it's just restricted to that. Christian singing is the musical use of the voice to express truth that accords with God's word and feelings that accord with God's worth. Say it again. Christian singing is the musical use of your voice to express truth that accords with God's word and feelings that accord with God's worth. It's a gift beyond measuring. 
And therefore, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. And come into his presence with singing. Father, would you please create an authentic song in our hearts? You are very, very great. We, we can't be satisfied with preaching. I love preaching. gave my life to preaching. We can't be satisfied with poetry. We can't be satisfied with painting. We can't be satisfied even with the glories of the heavens that are declaring your glory. We have to sing how great you are. So, don't let that be artificial. Don't let that be fake. Grant that we would experience you according to your worth and know you according to your truth as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen.